Hey folks, thanks so much for joining us for the second part of our BCDR on Databricks discussion here. Uh, again, like I mentioned, this is part two, uh, and it's going to focus on DR implementation. I'm Greg Wood, happy to be here and uh, doing this with uh, Lauren. You know, we've both been working on DR for a, a really long time. And, uh, you know, between the two of us, we've we've seen a lot of different implementations, struggles customers have had, and, and happy to put some of this expertise out in the world. Just to review again, please do check out the Security and Trust Center. This video is part of a sm very small part of our effort to make sure all of our customers have as much data as they can possibly ever want. Uh, the Security and Trust Center is a huge part of that. And uh, it really has everything you could possibly need from a security and trust standpoint, and it is constantly updated. So please check that out. If you haven't, and even if you have, give it another look, because like I said, it's always being updated. Just to review a bit on the overall implementation of DR on Databricks, there really is this cycle. And this is not something that happens uh, in a night or a day or a week. This is really typically a continual ongoing process and it can take months or even a year to, to get it up and running the first time. In reality, there's, there's a lot to think about. Uh, and even just the initial steps of planning can take a really long time. But to understand why, let's sort of step through what this looks like. So the first step here is just understanding the business needs. And this is a somewhat deceptively difficult thing to do uh, because this is all about finding the SLAs that make sense for your business. Uh, you know, typically, the shorter the SLA, the higher the cost is going to be. But when you're first talking, every single application uh, is most likely the application owners are going to say it's absolutely business critical and it needs to be up all the time. It may not always be the case. So being able to dig into the RPO and RTO requirements and then mapping all of the different pieces of Databricks and other applications that need to fit into that SLA is super important and also can be very difficult. Once you have that data though, it's up to you to then choose a recovery strategy. So that can go all the way from active passive or even just backup where you're creating a sort of cold backup of your system that can be restored in the case of a failure, but nothing else is happening versus active-active where you've got two parallel implementations that are always running side by side. Uh, where you land on that spectrum is really gonna depend on you know, how critical the workloads are, what the SLAs need to be, and then what your broader uh, DR strategy from an organizational perspective is. Then you need to analyze the current setup. And this is really about understanding all the different integration points and where the data sits, what your systems are today, how much automation you have. If you have infrastructure as code today, that's gonna to change the way that you then go and implement uh, DR itself. The next step, step four, is really defining the Databricks specific objects for your DR strategy, your chosen DR strategy to be successful. Then we get to step five, which is the implementation. And that's sort of what we're talking about today. We'll talk about some of the best practices there for, uh, for doing that implementation. And then finally is the monitoring and detection. And this really means just that you need to always be looking at uh, what's happening with your environment and deciding when a failover needs to happen. But you also need to be able to adapt your DR strategy over time so that as your business grows, as your needs change, you're able to update that implementation to match your DR strategy to the needs of the business. So what does it look like at a tactical level to do this replication? Now, this slide may you know, look a little bit intimidating, but we're gonna walk through it step-by-step. Step. Uh, and this is sort of the current state. Mm -hmm. And I say that because there is gonna be a change and we'll talk about what that change is in a second here. But walking through top to bottom, uh, first we need to talk about workspace assets. And that's what lives in the control plane. Like we were talking about uh, notebooks, cluster definitions, job definitions. Typically, we recommend that customers use a combination of Terraform and CICD to do the replication between the primary and secondary workspaces here. And what that means is basically you have a centralized repository of uh, notebooks, which could live in a Git provider, Azure DevOps, GitHub, whatever that might be. 
And then you have a repository of Terraform, which is going to define things like your clusters, your networking, uh, anything that needs to happen from that perspective that can be um, stored in those Terraform files. And basically, if you already have this set up for your primary workspace, all you need to do is also push those changes to your secondary workspace. Uh, and in that case, it's essentially a release process. So every time something changes, a uh, notebook changes, a job changes, that change get pushed, gets pushed to both workspaces in parallel. And so that you always have a mirror image of your primary and secondary. If you're not using CICD today, if you're not using Terraform today, um, you have some other method of doing this, that's fine. These are our best recommendations, um, but you can certainly plug and play any sort of provider of these tools that you currently use today. It doesn't have to be Terraform, it could be ARM, it could be cloud uh, formation, uh, but we do generally as a best practice recommend Terraform. If you're not doing any kind of centralized uh, release process, there is a tool called the Terraform Exporter that you can use as well uh, that works best for sort of small to mid-sized workspaces. It'll essentially create a snapshot of your primary workspace, and then that can be applied to the secondary workspace. That's another option. Moving down, we have identities. So this is user, users and groups within your workspaces. Fortunately here, this is really just uh, from the account level, assigning those users and groups to both workspaces. That might be done at failover time as part of your failover process, uh, such that your users and groups wouldn't have advanced access to a secondary workspace, uh, or you may just assign them at the time of creating the secondary workspace. That's really up to you. The benefit of not assigning until failover is that you don't have users potentially going into that workspace and making changes, um, which is uh, very much a desirable thing. But then you also are potentially adding some time to your RTO uh, SLA. So just match your requirements to your SLAs. Moving down, we have Unity Catalog. And this is where a bulk of the work comes today. Uh, and again, I say today because we're going to be changing that in the near future. We'll talk about that in the next slide. For Unity Catalog, we really need to get all of the metadata from region A to region B. And so that means things like the schemas themselves, right? permissions, uh, credentials and locations, shares for Delta sharing and recipients for Delta sharing. And all of that today is really done via scripts or via Terraform. You can do a centralized Terraform release process uh, where Terraform, every time you make a change to a table or a schema or anything like that, it's released centrally. Um, we don't see a ton of customers doing that, but it does happen. Or you can do some scripting to bring the metadata from region A to region B. We'll include some examples of this uh, in the Medium blog that's going to be a companion to this video. Uh, and so you'll get a sense of what that looks like in order to get uh, all of this metadata from uh, region A to region B via scripting. Moving down, we have our managed and external data. This can be done technically via either cloud service provider replication or deep clone. We recommend Deep Clone for all Delta data because it provides both transactionality, uh, which means you're always going to end up with either a full copy of your table or nothing. And it also provides incremental copies. So when you do a Deep Clone, it only copies the most recent changes to your data, which is great. There's a slightly different version of this between external and managed data. Again, we'll provide some examples of this in the companion blog so you can see exactly what that means. Uh, but it is certainly possible and, and very reasonable to do this uh, via scripting and deep clone today. For non-Delta data, we generally recommend cloud service provider replication. Uh, that's going to depend on the cloud that you're on. That could be GRS in the case of Azure, be uh, AWS. S3 managed uh, multi-region buckets if you're in AWS, and then GCP also has uh, multi-region buckets. So depending on the type of data and the cloud, you may have slightly different options. Finally, for streaming checkpoints, uh, note that this is really only possible to directly replicate those uh, offsets in the case of stateless streams. 
uh, for those, we recommend either cloud service provider or manual replication of those via just copying them on the cloud level. For stateful streams, you essentially need to do parallel reading into both regions. And uh, we'll link to a blog that discusses that in detail, again, in the, in the Medium blog. Now, I said that there is some changes coming for Unity Catalog. And so what does that look like? Essentially, what we're going to be doing in an upcoming release here is providing native replication of Unity Catalog metadata and also of managed tables uh, between two meta stores in different regions. So you'll be able to promote your secondary meta store to your primary meta store. In the background, we'll be copying all of that metadata and data for managed tables over for you and making sure that we tell you if anything has gone wrong, uh, record how much data is being copied, uh, notify you if, you if there are sort of nested views that have issues that are pointing to non-replicated data, et cetera. Once we have all of our uh, assets copied, we again need to do that monitoring and detection. And it's important to say here that the earlier you detect a outage, the easier your failover is going to be and the more time you're going to have to meet your SLA for RTO. So good detection is really paramount to good DR. There's a couple of tools here that we recommend. First, you know, as a very basic tool, the Databricks status page uh, does give you status for all the regions and all the services within each region of Databricks. So this is a nice thing to be able to plug into other monitoring tools so that you can get up-to-date real-time notification of outages of Databricks-specific services. As a broader monitoring framework, we do recommend using a tool, whether that's Datadog or Dynatrace as a third-party tool, or using the cloud service provider tools. Each cloud has their own offering there. And you can build, for example, the Databricks status page into that tool to provide a broader view of your cloud service health. So you do typically want to have a human in the loop here so that you know if something degrades, it may be a false alarm. You don't want to fail over uh, prematurely or have a you know false failover because failovers can be expensive and they can be costly. Uh, they can be complex and have implications for users. But uh, you can automate away a lot of the headache that goes along with monitoring and detection when it comes to using some of these tools. So we definitely do recommend that. So again, just to summarize this sort of uh, whirlwind tour of DR and Databricks, this is a very, very brief overview of DR. And again, we'll, we'll provide some, some more depth uh, as a Medium blog that goes along with this, and we'll link to that in the description. But just know that DR doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it takes a long time, and that's OK it always does require a proactive plan and it requires constant monitoring and updating to make sure you're right-sized with your organization's goals. Uh, that being said, you know, we do have abilities to help build out DR today. Uh, the future state's going to look even better. And then, uh, you know, we have a lot of customers that are, you know, either already implementing DR have uh, have a functional DR system today, are interested in DR. So do reach out to us You know, if you have similar needs and, and want to hear more about DR, hear more about our future capabilities. So I'm going to wrap up with that. Check out the Medium blog, and thanks for watching.